Yeah, that's when our faces are there. And then we're live. Okay, okay. good. Main event is coming up on the chat. Directed chats. Indie horror TV chats. I would say your little picture is like sort of in front, so that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And the sound is on. Yep. Okay. Got a trailer for it. <clears throat> the French films look really gory. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Oh, they, we were discussing this up at Grimfest. The French are into gory movies. They never used uh -huh. to. Ah, we're here. We're here. We're here. Yes. Oh, wow. We're on, kids. But I seem to be a mirror image of myself, which is very strange. <laughs> we are love. Hello, and you're live. Be back when a movie is on. Thanks. Bye bye. Whoever's just going. Oh, it, oh, that's right. We are love. Hello there. That's just a uh, hi. Bella Dark is saying hi. So I'm just I don't know if that has anything to do with this. I think you should go and introduce yourself, Nico. Oh, okay. I shall introduce myself. Hi, I'm Nico. Hi, hi, folks. I'm Nico. I'm waving desperately at the camera. Oh, yeah. You can see me now. Um, Nick Vince. And you can see a couple of chatterers behind me. Um, there's a slight delay between my voice on the screen and my voice in reality. I'm getting used to that. And the beautiful lady to my left is... Barbie Wild. Hi Barbie there. Barbie Wild. That way. So are we, we have to, welcome to the room. Yes, now I understand. Yes. Hello, Hello chat. Females. Females. Yes. Cool, don't worry about the delay, it comes across great. Nice to meet you, Nicholas. Hello, Barbie. Hello. Hello, esteroscopic. Esteroscopic. Esteroscopic, thank you, Barbie. <laughs> I think we have to point out to our viewers that this is very in, early in the morning for us, because we're in Europe. We're in so, Europe. I'm still in my pajamas and dressing gown. It's that early in the morning. It's that early. I'm not, I'd like to say. <laughs> <laughs> I am doing a Peter Cushing and wearing my bedroom slippers, however, just like he did on Star Wars because his boots were too tight. So we have I think a question. question is coming in. Yes, we have a question that uh, had about lovely glasses. So how awful was the makeup process being transformed into a terrifying Cenobite. We'll take that question first. Uh, yeah, it's difficult. They were difficult. I mean, Barbie will tell you about hers in a moment, but basically when I was wearing the uh, Chatterer makeup, I couldn't hear, speak or see. But even the process before then, um, actually having your head cast in plaster, um, that was interesting. But what was worse for me was having the body cast done uh, to because they covered from my neck down to my elbows and my knees in plaster of Paris so they could sculpt the costume to my figure and um, the bits of plaster fell onto my toes and I have hairy toes and pulling the parts of pulling out all the hair from my toes I remember it was very painful very painful but yeah, so there were challenges to wearing the Chatterer makeup. Barbie, what about you? What oh, was me. it like okay. to you? <laughs> that wasn't a, that wasn't just a delay. That was a brain delay. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, I had to do a head cast, and I'm very claustrophobic. So, um, so they could get all the pieces of makeup to to be glued onto my face perfectly. I had to have a cast made of my head, and. Um, that was sort of ugly because, as probably Nico will tell you, you know, you, you first you're covered in this stuff called alginate, and then they wrap your head with plaster bandages, and um, the only sort of input you have from the outside world is the air that you're breathing. They don't have straws or anything. It's just someone is making sure the alginate isn't dripping into your nose. That's their only job. And uh, but as soon as they put the, the bandages on, they kind of warm up as they dry. And I felt that the air was getting warm, so I thought I was suffocating. And I sort of went, ah. And uh, they said, it's OK, Barbie, it's OK, don't panic. But I did have a panic attack. But I think one of the actors, I can't remember who, 
got so panicked during his body cast process that he ripped everything off, which didn't they love him to the makeup crew. Do you remember who that was? Or we should, maybe we shouldn't say because I, I, to be, I, that's the first time I've heard the story. I don't remember really? anybody doing that. Oh, it was but... one of the Franks, I think. It wasn't Oliver. Um, who played Skinless Frank? Was it Oliver? Oliver Smith. Yes, it wasn't him. I can't remember who it was. But this I, is. I've not heard the story. I've not heard the story before. A awful story. Perhaps it's just an <laughs> urban Hellraiser legend. <laughs> um, the next question we have is from the new old man time you ever meet Clive um, I knew Clive before I made the first movie um, I'd known Clive for about two or three years uh, before I met before I made Hellraiser um, because I um, modeled for him um, I'd met him up in Crouch End which is uh, he was living at the time and there where I used to be at drama school and uh, I did modeling for him so I'm on the front covers of his versions of the books of blood um, they were published in Europe and America they've just republished some of them you can see parts of his paintings on the front covers um, so I did a lot of modeling for him um, and then what, through that he just asked me if he wanted to be in a movie so Clive and I have been friends uh, since way before we actually made the movies. What about you, Barbie? I think I met Clive about halfway through the filming of Hellraiser 2. Um, obviously, he, he was prepping Nightbreed, I believe, at the time. So uh, the, the whole, obviously, it was his idea, Hellra uh, Hellraiser 2. But Pete Atkins wrote the script. Tony Randall did my uh, audition in the director. So I didn't meet Clive until about halfway through, but it was after, because of Nico, it was after the filming that I really got to know Clive. We used to have wonderful dinners at the Rasa Sayang restaurant in Soho, London. And um, it was always, you know, brilliant and amusing and, and wonderful as always. So uh, we, had, we both met Clive, but obviously Nico knows him much better. Um, so the next question, um, how long after the casts were made, uh, this is from Arises, how long after the casts were made did it take to get into the makeup uh, before each shoot? Well, it was easier, much easier for me to get into the makeup because mine was like a balaclava mask. It just, I just needed um, a bald cap over my head and then the mask, then the teeth went into, were attached to my teeth, um, like a set of dentures. And then the mask itself just wrapped around my face. There was a slit up the back. Um, and uh, so that, my whole process was about an hour for the chatterer. Barbie, how, what about take, you? how long did it take for you to get into your costume? Was that? That, included, that was included in the hour. I mean, the okay. costume for me, I, I, did you have a leotard to wear? Barbie? Um, I can't remember. I must I have I had a leotard to wear that had the pieces of uh, flesh that you can see through the costume. It was stuck to a leotard. Uh, and then the leather jacket went over that and was zipped up the back. So, um... I think my, my flesh was actually on the costume. <laughs> okay. Um, my makeup process took four hours sitting in a chair, being made up by extremely patient makeup artists, Little John and Mark, and um, and then it was half an hour to get uh, laced up into the costume. Um, I made a terrible mistake the first day, thinking I was going to be cold, so I was wearing very heavy lycra tights underneath the costume and leather boots. And then I got sort of covered with makeup on every exposed part of my flesh. So not only was I horribly jet lagged because my plane had been delayed 24 hours, and so I arrived from Heathrow and drove straight to, to Pinewood, but I was also completely covered. I think I suffered a little bit from the Shirley Eaton in Goldfinger effect, in that every part of my body was covered by either leather, makeup, lycra, you know, so I was feeling a bit altered by the end of the day yeah uh, yeah uh, yeah um next question is lp dan fall 26 
What's it like to do a film like Hellraiser acting wise? Is it harder to shoot a horror movie? Um, I mean, for me, these were my first three movies because I, I was lucky enough to go on and do uh, Nightbreed as well. So those were the only movies I'd ever made. Um, it was, as I mentioned before, it was hard because I couldn't hear speak or see on the first Hellraiser movie. Um, so it was difficult to take directions um, and people had to literally physically shout in my ear through the makeup to let me know what it was they wanted me to do. Um, so I didn't have, so I wasn't really conscious about what was going on around me. Um, I mean, I do remember when they did the uh, exploding Frank at the end of the first movie, uh, one of the girls who'd lost her uncle um, about a couple of weeks before was running off the set and throwing up because it just looked so realistic, everything that they were doing on the set. Um, it just looked very, very realistic. So I think that was, was tough for them. What about you, Bobby? Uh, well, this was my, I think it was my third film. I did Hellraiser, and then I did Grizzly 2, which is the holy grail of unfinished, unreleased horror, supposedly. It's got George Clooney in it. Laura Dern, Charlie Sheen, but has never seen the light of day, and a, a big mechanical bear that didn't, kept breaking down. So this was, you know, it was another acting job for me. And I think it's, it's sort of like when people say, oh, is it more difficult to do comedy? Or is it, you know, acting drama and stuff like that? I think as an actor, you just have to approach each, each job and say, what's my motivation? You know, the thespian kind of things, or um, you know, it, it's it's just it's acting, whether it's horror or anything. It's like you know, just watch recently watching the film with Peter Cushing in it, I was so impressed. I mean, it's not a very good film, but he was so wonderful in it because, every, I'm not saying I'm as ever as good an actor as Peter Cushing, but because every film he did, whether it was a drama with Deborah Carr or a horror movie with Christopher Lee, he was in the moment, as they mm -hmm. say, acting. And so I think that's, being in a horror film, I think you have things like, you know, wearing the makeup, you know, the horrible costumes and masks and stuff, that's an extra thing you have to deal with, of course. But, you know, I don't think The Elephant Man could be conceived as a horror film, and yet John Hurt had to um, wear an ex exceedingly hideous amount of makeup and he still was brilliant in it. So it's every every film role has its challenges, I think. Mm. Um, this is from, next question, as Terrioscopic again. I have a silly question, but one would expect you guys having to have nightmares about the film. Did you guys have some bad dreams about it, such strong imagery, and, and it has such strong imagery and energy? I don't remember having nightmares about it particularly. Um, I do remember falling asleep inside the costume. Um, it was one of the days on which they didn't film me. Um, and they used to leave me in the, cos in the makeup. Um, they, they took the teeth out, but they left me in the mask for eight hours. And I was asleep upstairs in the house uh, with a lady called Rosemary Sylvester Fisher who was looking after me because I had somebody with me at all times. Um, so we would just sleep on one of the beds in the house. Um, and uh, I woke up second. Basically, Rosemary woke up next to the chattering Cenobite um, and screamed and stopped filming. Um, but no, I don't remember having any nightmares. Well, not whilst I was filming. What about you, Barbie? Did you dream about it? I'm actually kind of, you know, sensitive. I have a huge amount of nightmares about different things. Um, and I have to say, I don't think I had one during the filming, if that means. Um, no, absolutely not. I never had any dreams about it because you, you're so, you know, when you're watching the movie, you're going, oh, my God. And it was so wonderful when recently... Um, Nico and I were at Grimfest and we watched it on the big screen in the front row, which was kind of almost awesome because of the Dolby sound. 
um, and thinking, wow, this has got so much amazing imagery in it, this film, Hellbound, and, and Hell, Hellraiser as well. But when you're on set, it, you do have the gritty realities of film. And that means, you know, the uncomfortableness of the makeup, you know, danger, you know, with chains and hooks going into people's mouths, like with Nico and, and Doug got hit by a chain and um, at some point. And, and, you know, people running around and you're, whoops. Uh, oh, you just got an advert on the, uh, oh, yes. if you wait for about two, three seconds, it'll disappear. You can oh, click on skip okay. ad. Click on skip ad in the bottom right hand corner. Sorry, folks, our vision's just disappeared. I found don't, Barbie? I can't see skip ad. Down at the bottom right. Oh, You're oh, we're still back. there. You, you can still yeah. be seen by everybody. You're back. Okay, oh, cool. No. So you just saw me poking at the, the keyboard. That's terrible. Um, yeah, so what you were saying Yeah, the gritty think... realities of filming, and when you're sort of moving towards the chain, you're actually facing a, a camera crew. So, yeah. you know. And I, I think when I first... I remember when I first saw the movie in the theatre, you don't watch it... Or I didn't watch it as a movie because I was remembering, oh, yeah, we filmed that bit at the studio, but that bit at the house uh, on the first movie. You just remember the experience of making the film. So it was probably about two or three years later um, when I saw it on video that I actually sat down and watched it as a movie rather than watching your own performance or remembering the whole creation of the movie. Um, it took some time to get some distance uh, in that uh, in that sense. Um, next question is from Ghost Dave two thousand and eight. Night Reed was good. Uh, do you think there will be a sequel? Um, Ghost Dave, uh, there's the Cabal Cut coming out next year on DVD Blu-ray. Uh, it's being screened at Eerie this weekend, or has just been screened at Eerie this weekend um, with Russell Charrington. Um, there's Lots of talk about a TV series for Nightbreed. Um, a gentleman called Michael Plamides um, has been working with Morgan Creek uh, to get a TV series together. Uh, the last I heard was they had another project, the Exorcist TV series. Um, once they had that out of the way, then they were going to start concentrating on Nightbreed um, and start bringing that uh, to our screens. Timescales, no idea. But uh, it'll, come, it'll be coming from Morgan Creek, from what I understand, and Michael Plamides uh, is helming it. Uh, cool. How did Doug Bradley handle being the lead villain on top of the costume? Uh, and Barbie, this is from Mr. Skeeter Buster. So the first question is, how did Doug Bradley handle being the lead villain on top of the costume? That's uh, really a question for Doug. Um, I don't know if I can answer that on his behalf. But Barbie, totally off the horror genre, tell us how it was working with Charles Bronson. How was he, God rest his soul, to work with? Well, I, I think I, I do remember Doug saying, for answering the, the question sure. that is for either of us, um, is that he, it, with the first time he looked in the mirror and saw him as Pinhead, it was an extraordinary moment. And I know I felt the same. Um, looking at myself, you know, at the time I was doing a lot of TV presenter and presenting and I was myself. And then all of a sudden I'm this, you know, bald babe from hell. <laughs> and it was quite an extraordinary moment. I think that he, he felt that as well. And it, it is, um, it's sort of a transforming experience. And I think that, of course, it, it, you know, his voice had so much to do with it as well. Getting on to, to Death Wish, um, Charles Bronson was a really a lovely, gentle, adorable, funny guy. Um, I didn't have that many scenes with him. I threw a beer bottle at him, and I got to scream when um, Gavin O'Herlihy, my boyfriend in the film, was sort of blasted through um, the wall of an apartment building with a a Gatling gun or something like that that Chuck just happened to have in his closet. Um, but no, he was he was great. And Michael Winner was very funny and waspish and not easy to work with. Uh, but he was 
a very funny guy and you just had to realize, oh, he's not actually being horribly mean, Michael Winner. He's just, this is just his sense of humor. But uh, it was an extraordinary uh, experience because we were supposed to be filming in New York, but we were filming in the ruins of a hospital in South London called Lambeth Hospital. And there were all these American cop cars everywhere. And um, the, the, the funny thing about the film was Alex Winter played one of the horrible thugs. And he went on to find fame as um, one of Bill and Ted, one of the Bill and Ted team in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And now he's, an, he's a director. So uh, it was a very, it was a great experience. You know. Cool. Um, question from Erises. What was the most interesting and or funny thing that happened on the set of, e of Hellraiser for each of you? Gosh, that's a tough one. Um, I, I can't think of it. It's too early in the morning. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> the most interesting or funny thing that... We did laugh an awful lot. As I say, chattering, I really couldn't see much of what was going on. Um, so... But you, stuff... you can go onto YouTube? Oh, sorry. Say again? You can go onto YouTube and, well... Um, I think it was Jeff Puddyfoot who did the... Um, no, that's Roy Puddyfoot and Jeff Portas. Yes. Um, he, one of the, the part of the makeup crew did a lot of videoing behind the scenes. So there's segments of uh, Butterball, Simon Butterball Bamford doing the can can in his Butterball outfit, which is hilarious. You laughing a lot, Nico. Yeah. yeah. Um, Doug being really cool, smoking cigarette with his uh, cigarette holder so that didn't destroy the makeup, looking like the the noble coward of monsters, and I would be um, uh, singing songs from Cabaret uh, because it was, we did have to do a lot of waiting. Um, yeah. I think that was, any, I can't really think of, you know, coming through, I think our first entrance, uh, you know, when we come through the dry ice and stuff like that and the moving wall, that was a pretty, that was really interesting and it was extraordinary to be part of that because you that this was an awesome scene, even though you know you couldn't see much through the dry eyes. Yeah, I, I, there is that moment actually that, that on the second movie, um, I do remember because they had these big um, spotlights behind us um, to get the light coming from the um, well behind us from the tunnel. Uh, and I do remember standing there in costume and makeup and Roy Puddyfoot asking me if I felt hot. Um, I was feeling warm, and I said, yes, I do, really. And he just said, good, OK, we'll, we'll move you now because you're smouldering. Um, because the costume was just getting so warm. Um, it was, uh, yeah, uh, that was fun. Um, next question is from Swick55. Hellraiser 2 was rewritten when Andrew Robinson didn't reprise his role as Larry. How much did the movie change from the original script? I didn't see a script. I didn't see this, the original script uh, in that case. My memory is, um, yeah, because they wouldn't have, they would have known that fairly early on, I think, that Andrew wasn't coming back. Um, I was getting pink pages every day. Yeah, that but that was. But I don't remember Andrew Robinson being in it when in the script that I've got. I, no I, the original um, script I've got did have Andy in it. I think. It, it did it. Yeah. I obviously only looked at the pages on which I was on in that case. <laughs> As you. <we> um, <laughs> I do remember that Pete Atkins and Tony Randall, uh, well, because Pete uh, lived in Liverpool at the time, and he was staying in a hotel around the corner from Harrods, um, and basically he was just writing um, constantly. Um, he used to come out with us in the evenings occasionally, um, but I, and I'd completely forgotten that Andrew was in the original script, so I'm not sure how much there were, um, how many changes there were. 
Interesting question from the new, sorry, they're all interesting questions. Um, the new old man time again. If you had the chance to work with Kubrick, Lynch or Scott, who would you choose? If you had a chance to work with either Kubrick, Lynch or Scott, who would you choose? That would be a very interesting question. I've... Mm. Well, um, oh, Bobby, I'm Kubrick, a little stumped on that one. Stanley Kubrick is no longer with us, so. So working with I zombie think, Kubrick would be interesting. A zombie Kubrick would be interesting. Um, David Lynch is an extraordinary director, but I, I love his work. But I think I'll have to say Ridley Scott because I've met him and he was really sweet. I went up for a Barclays Bank commercial. And um, that was at the time when I had, like, bright blue hair. And he had just done, I think he'd just done Blade Runner. And uh, I walked in, and he went, wow, you look amazing. And I thought, really, Scott thinks I look amazing? Because I had just gone for the whole blue hair, and um, I was wearing this ripped wedding dress with, you know, leather bits everywhere and a leather waistcoat. Uh, but I didn't get the job, unfortunately. They went for someone tall. But um, it was it was you know a little bright spark meeting someone as as and he was just really a very very nice person and I love his work. I think his work is well. So, Nico, who yeah, would you? They're all so different in their own way, aren't they? I was reading about uh, Stanley Kubrick recently, um, and about the house and the collection he left behind when he died. Um, and the people who are going through that, because his attention to detail was absolutely extraordinary. Um, he was scouting a location, but he didn't visit the location himself. He sent one of his assistants with a camera, and the cam and the guy had to photograph the street. Now, by that I mean he took a step ladder with him, climbed up the step ladder, photographed the front door of the street of a house, then moved the step ladder to the next house and photographed that, and then did it all the way up one side of the street and all the way down the other side of the street. Um, and then once all the photographs were developed, and this is the days before digital photography, he just laid them all out in a long stretch because he was looking for a front door that he put, you know, to use in one of his movies. Um, and he just literally just they were laid down my entire corridor, uh, this entire thing. So I would imagine it must be, you know, very precise, you know, that must have a very clear vision of what he wanted. All I know of David Lynch is that he, you know, remarkably generous and uh, interesting guy. Yeah, again, Ridley Scott, all very, very interesting. So probably the actor's answer would be um, anybody who would employ me. Yeah. <laughs> happy to work with any of them. I think Kubrick made Shelley Duvall cry on uh, The Shining. So I think he's, his vision is so overpowering that sometimes his, you know, he, he, he may not be considered an actor's director, although, I mean, I don't know for sure. Um, I, there was a lovely story about David Lynch where uh, when he was making Eraserhead, he sat down in a cafe with all of his actors and the people who were helping and said, listen, I have no money to make this film, but I promise you, you'll all get a cut of it if it ever gets distributed. And he wrote little napkins, everybody's percentage, and said, this is our contract. And, um, oh, that's right, because the log lady. The log lady told the us the log story lady at lunch. From Twin Peaks was uh, at a recent convention that Nico and I were at, and she was saying, she, st she was like, sort of like the producer, or she was doing something behind she the scenes. She was assistant um, to David Lynch, I said And as she well. said she still gets a check every year from the Eraserhead, and I think, wow, that's amazing in, in this business. He's yeah. a man of his word. Yes, absolutely, and I think, you know, she said she put her daughter through college. Um, one of her, her children through to college on that, which I think is just brilliant. Uh, next question is from Mr. Skeeter Buster. How did you two handle lunch breaks while in makeup for Hellraiser? 
how do we handle lunch breaks? It was very simple. Um, they didn't give me any. <laughs> I couldn't eat. Uh, once I was in makeup, I was given uh, straws and so on. Um, if if I was left in the makeup all day, then I just didn't eat. It was really straightforward. Um, but they did give you know water through through a straw. That didn't happen often. I didn't. I suppose I only had about twelve days filming on Hellraiser, um, so and it wasn't one after another. It was, um, you know, there were there were breaks in between. I think I probably only did two consecutive, two or three consecutive days. Um, but yeah, what about you, Barbie? Did, well, I just you hope to you talk to your equity representative, darling. <laughs> I don't believe we had one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, we would have sandwiches. I, I could eat very carefully like a little mouse because obviously the makeup was, my lips were free. And, uh, but, you know, the, my makeup artists were always going, Barbie, stop talking, Barbie, stop talking, because, you know, the, the makeup come away from being glued here. Uh, but one time, I remember, we felt very rebellious, and I can't remember who came with me. It might have been Doug and Ken, but we went to the, the commissary, the, the um, uh, cafeteria at Pinewood in full costume, walked in, and uh, decided we were going to just go along the line with our trays and, and have a, a proper lunch. And of course, we were halfway through it when somebody ran in and said, you've got to come back to the set. So um, the eating wasn't too much of a problem for me. I just had to be really careful. No greasy food. No greasy food. Yeah, I, I, there was no fried food, no greasy food, because it affected the uh, the, the, the rubber and the, uh, the glue and yeah. destroyed, destroyed the rubber. The yeah. yeah, it just destroyed the rubber foam. Sorry, I was just moving the laptop around. Um, it's stereoscopic again. Many horror films have anecdotic uh, events like paranormal events in some sort of legendary in horror. Did you guys experience some paranormal events, accidents, deaths? The reason uh, for such a question is I'm a very sensitive individual myself, energetically speaking, thanks. Did we have anything... We, I presume you're talking about things like um, uh, The Exorcist and The Curse associated with certain movies. Um, no, uh, none as far as I'm aware on any of the Clive Barker movies. Um, did we have anything? No, I don't think we had anything. Barbie, do you remember anything? No, no, just I, I felt altered because being in the, the costume and early morning things and, you know, you're just, but there was nothing sort of spooky or paranormal normal or su supernatural happening during the filming that I was aware of. No, no. Um, next question. Uh, Doug Bradley recently became a U.S. citizen. Have either of you considered moving to America? Um, not recently. I have not considered recently moving to America. Um, I remember my parents saying after they visited San Francisco, they could imagine me living there because um, it's such a wonderful place. Um, but I have no plans at the moment. But this is a special question for Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually Canadian, but I grew up in the United States. So I spent, I guess, what would be called my formative years there, and I went to university there. Um, but I was losing kind of focus in university. Um, although I loved doing my drama classes and stuff, I, I got involved in doing theater and teaching drama to little um, kids, uh, specifically handicapped children and children with special needs. And I just thought, I'm never going to get my degree here. So there was a program in London, part of my university, to study uh, with like all the best schools, we had teachers from Weber Douglas and Lambda and Rada, and, I, and a friend of mine had just come back from London, having done the course in, in theater production, uh, and I just thought, wow, I got to get to London. 
And um, my parents were a bit sad, but my father said, you know, I'd rather you be in London than go down to New York and try and be, you know, because at the time I thought I'd be in musical theater. And um, he said, I'll never have a quiet night if you're living in New York, because those were the days when New York was um, rather more interesting than it is now. And so I came to London, and it was all part of my university course, and I discovered I was able to stay. So um, going back, I think um, my life and family and friends are, I mean, I do have family, of course, in the States and in Canada still, but I, I don't know is the question. So there would have to be a very compelling reason for me to move back. But I ne you know, never say never. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I'm probably the same thing. Barbie, did you want to take over reading out the questions? Um, well, actually, I think that might be better if you continue, if you don't mind, okay. because my, my very vocals are kind of, I have to move my head around in a weird way, and people may think <laughs> I'm like this strange puppet. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to, to do say to Grimm, oh no, sorry, um, a, a stereoscopic, sorry, didn't mean to be too grim, you weren't too grim. No, not too so stereoscopic. Uh, no. Um, uh, Mr. Skeeter Buster, what from a personal standpoint is the most fond, memorable moment from being part of the Hellraiser cast? Oh. That's always a tough one. I think it's actually the people that I met. It has to be the people that I met. I form great friendships with, um, apart from Barbie, um, but Jeff Portis and Roy Puddyfoot, um, they and um, I become great friends. We used to see each other each Sunday. I used to travel up to meet them for lunch um, from Sussex where I was living in London to, to meet up. Um, a place called The Fallen Angel in Islington. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's just the wonderful people, um, and you know, all the talented people. Nigel Booth, who designed the Chatterer, Little John, Little John Cormican, who designed uh, female Cen the original female Cenobite. Did he do your makeup, Barbie? Little, little, little John? John and Mark did my makeup. Yeah, Little John and Mark did your makeup. I, I still see Little John occasionally. Um, uh, we're still friends. Um, uh, so yeah, for me, it's not so much a particular incident, it's the people, you know, the, and the fact that still 26 years later, I'm still talking to people about Hellraiser, I just find that extraordinary um, and wonderful. What about you, Barbie? Well, I, I have to agree, it's, it's meeting all the extraordinary people, um, you know, my fellow Cenobites, Simon, Nico, and, and Doug, but also... Claire Higgins, Ash, the lovely Ashley Lawrence, and the equally <laughs> Ken Cranham. Um, so it, it's um, it is the people, and it's also you know as you say, for me, twenty five years later, meeting fans who still find our you know relatively small budget British horror movies before they went to America and became the franchise. Um, you know, so so intriguing and so mythic. Twenty five mm. years later, it's actually kind of wonderful. Yeah. So, um, I, I, it, it's the fans and the, the friends, the fans and yeah. the friends. Yeah, fans and the friends. Um, uh, from Indie Horror, I'm a huge fan of Kenneth Cranham as Doctor Chenard. What was it like working with him, and do you have any anecdotes from the set with Kenneth? I don't, from the set with Kenneth, I think probably more from Barbie, because I think Barbie probably spent more time with him, because um, I didn't have any scenes with him. Um, but I've met That's Ken... Like <laughs> <laughs> I met Ken a couple of times this year. Uh, we did a double bill screening in uh, Birmingham of um, uh, Hellraiser and Hellbound. Uh, with Jeff Portis there and Simon and Ken and I doing questions and answers. That was a great deal of fun. Ken is a fascinating man. Um, really, really interesting man. And I went to see him in a play called The Herd, uh, which is still on in London for anybody who's in London. Though I think it's sold out. In fact, he had to get me tickets, especially, uh, to go and see it. Um, I, he's 
just a really interesting man because he's been around for so long and worked with so many great and interesting people. So not any particular story from Ken, apart from the fact that he's great. I really enjoy his company. Um, he does think of me as Vince rather than Nick. That's the problem with having a surname and a first name that can both be first names. He always refers to me as Vince. He introduced me to Zoe Wanamaker the other evening as Vince. It's like, that's fine. <laughs> I like being called Vince. That's great. Um, he's lovely. Really, really nice guy. Well, we want to put you. Well, it's it's just sort of an embarrassing story. Um, he was in full channered Cenobite makeup on the phone to his wife. And somebody pointed him out, him out to me and said, oh, that's Ken. That's, you know, um, Ken Cranham, who's playing Dr. Chenard. And so I thought, oh, I've got to go over and introduce myself. And I was in full female Cenobite makeup. Oh, I can't remember if he was makeup or not. I can't remember. I think, actually, he was just normal. And I was in full Cenobite makeup. And I went over and went, hi, Ken. My name is Barbie. Why don't we get married and have babies called Pepper and Skipper? Now, that's a real American joke, obviously, because of Barbie doll and Ken doll. And I thought that would be really funny. But he was on the... <laughs> he said, I've got this actress talking to me, darling. I must go. And I just thought, what, why did you say that? Why did you embarrass yourself? <laughs> but it was kind of my little shtick, you know, because Barbie is not a common name to be found in, in the UK. So I just thought it was kind of funny. But... He was. He took it with with um, good grace. Although his his wife probably wondered what the hell was going on. <laughs> um, this is an off the wall question, but are either of you adept at any musical instruments in addition to acting talent? Um, no, I mean I studied the French horn when I was at school. Um, so up until about the age of 16, 17, um, I wasn't very good at it. I used to be able to pay about three pieces on the piano, um, some really easy pieces on the piano. Um, kind of know my way around a keyboard, but not me. Barbie, you? Um, I studied the piano for about five years, from when I was about nine, or eight or nine to when I was about 13. And I, I got fairly well up the, the, I would go and do these grading, they, they, we called them auditions, but actually they were just grading ceremonies. And I, I always did pretty well, but I had kind of, a, it was kind of natural for me. And so I could get away with practicing for an hour before I could go to my lesson. But then my teacher started giving me Beethoven, and you can't do that. You can't fake Beethoven. So... <laughs> Also, I was getting interested in doing drama and stuff like that, and I, so I broke my mother's heart and said I didn't want to take piano lessons anymore. And she said, you'll regret it, you know. And I kind of do, actually. But um, I, did, I did sort of rediscover it for a while. I did take harpsichord. I remember in university for a, a semester, and I also, believe it or not, took bagpipe lessons as part of my university course. I took a semester of bagpipe. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I had a crush on my bagpipe teacher. That explains <laughs> that one. I never knew that. I... <laughs> <laughs> it's so embarrassing, but hey. So... String um... to my bow, darling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do each of you do recreational and for pastime actors activities uh, as of lately? Um, what do I do recreate? I don't really seem to have too much recreation time. Um, I suppose walking the dog um, is a new thing I've been doing in the last year, um, which is fun. So. Uh, and now of late, the dog takes me for walks because he's very clear as to which of the three parks he would like to go to. Um, so walking the dog, um, I watch a lot of, uh, I watch, probably watch far too much television. Um, I read all the time. Um, I read every day. 
Um, that's mostly what I'm doing. But currently, uh, I just finished reading Roger Corman's biography, uh, How I Made 100 Movies in Hollywood and Never Lost a Dime. That is fascinating. Really, really interesting um, book, uh, which I highly recommend to anybody. And I shall be seeing Roger Corman in question and answer at the end of the week. So that's the other thing I've been doing recently is going along to the BFI, uh, the British Film Institute in London, because they're doing a gothic season of horror. Um, so I'm getting to see all these great old movies on the big screen. And I am currently reading The Price of Fear by Joel Eisner, which is a biography with Vincent Price. Unfortunately, I'd only give it three stars out of five because it's so badly edited. Um, you, there is a lot by Vincent Price in it, but it is so badly edited. Um, it's a real shame. But um, no, just to read about Vincent Price is great. What do you do recreationally, Barbie? Um, well, I think um, the for a, a, just to, to you know as a change from writing and stuff. I I, I do watch a lot of movies. I mean, we occasionally watch a bit of television, but um, it's, it's movies are the thing that I love to do. I want to be, you know, involved in the writing of them. So we, I, I would say, for the most part, watching movies is my primary recreational thing. Doing Facebook, too, but don't tell anybody. And, uh, <laughs> and going for long walks. Um, I, I find walking very... Uh, inspiring and you get to do a lot of good thinking while you walk as well so it doesn't sound very um, exciting though does it I, I, I don't ski I don't <laughs> rollerblade um, anything else I can't really think actually I, I l enjoy reading too and I think my big regret is I don't have as, as much time to read as I would like to uh, the last book that I remember reading uh, is a fantastic book called Whitstable by Stephen Volk. And it's about Peter Cushing in the days after his wife's death. And he, I don't know how Stephen Volk did it, but he just so channels the grief that he must have felt this, you know, life partner dying. And then this young boy comes up to him and says, you're the vampire killer, right? I have a vampire that you can kill. And so it's, it, it's sort of, it's almost autobiographical, and yet it's still fiction. It's quite an extraordinary book. So that's the last book I've read. Oh, interesting. It's on, it's on my, I've got a signed copy of it. It's on my bookshelf to read. Um, uh, yeah, which is after, it's going to be after, probably after Neil Gaiman's book that I'm reading next as well. Uh, question for you, Barbie. Where in Canada? I'm from Calgary, and this is from Swelk55. A tiny little town in British Columbia. Fabulous British Columbia. It's very obscure. And then I moved to Spokane, Washington when I was six. I mean, a lot of my Canadian cousins think it's a bit bogus that I claim to be Canadian because I didn't spend much of my life in Canada. But I feel Canadian. My soul is Canadian. Yeah. Okay. My grandfather fought for the Canadians in the First World War. That's my only connection with Canada. I've never been there. I would love to go there. Love well, to go. My, gra my grandfather actually fought in the Royal, uh, the Royal Flying Corps uh, against the Germans. Um, he, so he fought for the British. So he did the other trip because, I mean, basically my grandfather left home because, according to my mother, he had too many sisters. <laughs> and um, he decided to leave them and emigrated to Canada um, and ended up like, probably about 1911. Anyway, that, that's off the topic, sorry. <laughs> Somehow, this is from Essia, um, uh, Esterius, oh, oh, I can't say your name. Esterioscopic. Esterioscopic. Is this a, a word that I just don't know? It's completely new to me. Somehow horror or dark themes had become quite popular recently on primetime television. Uh, uh, TWD, Hannibal, um, American Horror Story, etc. 
Why do you think society has somehow embraced this part of the human psyche in recent years? Um, thanks, Americanly speaking. That's interesting. That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I do wonder what I was thinking about this the other day and wondering, asking the same question um, as to why things have got so popular on television. Uh, we have had a few things over from the UK. Um, uh, TV channels as well produced in the UK. Um, they, they all seem to be there bubbling away under the surface. I think people live in difficult times. Um, horror tends to be more popular when times are hard. Um, you, know, you look at the 1930s and 1940s, um, what was going on in the world, you saw, you know, this is when some of the world the classic horrors, horror movies were made. Um, I think people are interested in that when they are dealing with difficult times. Clive Barker was writing about something similar recently uh, on Facebook, uh, and he was saying that um, what for him, what horror is about, uh, is about the exploration of death um, and endings. Um, you know, it's about, and it's the same for me. Is the reason I'm interested in horror is because it asks all the big questions. It deals with the biggest questions of all about being alive, which is death. Um, so I have no social skill, social scientific skills to back up this theory, but I do wonder if it's because we live in such difficult times that people are really interested in finding some you know asking these big questions rather than being very comfortable um when they tend not to want to think about these things perhaps i don't know barbie any thoughts on that well i think it's all kind of cyclical i mean you mentioned the 30s and 40s but in the 50s which was a time of enormous paranoia in the united states you had films like Invasion of the Body Snatchers Invaders from Mars The Day the Earth Stood Still they were sci-fi but they still had horror elements to it. In the 60s, you had sort of amazing horror movies. Um, I just read a wonderful um, article by a friend of mine called Gabriel Ricard, who writes for Drunk Monkeys and the website. And um, he was talking about the horror movies of the 70s. And, and the 80s, of course, we're all part of. I think it's, it comes in cycle. I remember uh, you know, some time ago, there was this wonderful TV series called American Gothic, which was a horror series. And um, I think there are lots of reasons absolutely to do with, you know, we're going through tough times. But if you go back to the 70s, there were some really tough times then. Every, every decade has its tough times. Mm. And I think in Hollywood, where a lot of these things come, there are people sitting in rooms going, OK, we need an idea for a TV series. Zombies are popular. Horror has had, you know, if you just have to go on to, to iTunes to see how popular horror movies are. And as a friend of mine who's a director said, when she started in horror, she said the thing about horror fans is they forgive poor production values. So if you want to make a film, um, it's, it's, the horror is a way in. And you can get funding, you can do something. I mean, one of her films was Confederate Zombie Massacre. <laughs> and she just got a lot of her friends lying around on the field, and then they came up again. So it is, you know, but horror is very popular at the moment. So to get a TV series about zombies or to get a, you know, a TV series based on an enormously popular character like Hannibal, it's almost like, well, yeah, I could see that. That would get, give, give me a green light, especially since how Dexter has been so popular. You know, these are sort of sl slightly, I mean, I haven't seen the Hannibal series and I really want to say it, but Dexter is, is adorable and I really like him, but he is kind of a sanitized serial killer. So I, I think it's a cyclical thing. I do think people like horror because of all the, the things that, that Nico said. Absolutely. You explore, explore these things about death and loss and all these things. But it is, again, I think it is a cyclical thing. It's in, and I also think that you know when something becomes popular 
producers, publishers, think, oh, well, that's popular. Let's do something else in a similar genre because it's mm-hmm. popular. Um, because that seems a logic, you know, people are into this. So they, they tend to expand organically um, like that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, question for me for Eresis, what is my dog's name? My dog's name is Bertie. Um, or Bertmund, as my uh, niece insists on calling him. He's Bertie. He's Bertie from Battersea. Uh, he's a rescue dog. Um, and he's asleep and snoring beside me at the moment. Um, and, and Mr. Horror, Skeeter Buster just went the bagpipes. Roddy yes. Piper. <laughs> Let me get that. I don't, unfortunately. Roddy Piper, wasn't he in They Live by John Carpenter? I, d- I don't recognize the reference at all. Perhaps Mr. Skeeter Buster that- can clarify that one for us. I think he was a former wrestler, and he he was the lead in They Live. I might be wrong. I, I saw that film 20 years ago. So, A question for Barbie. When yes. was the first time you saw the film and got to hear the alterations to your voice, and what was your initial reaction? Ooh, things keep getting there. Um, I think, uh, well, we, we all saw the film in the cast screening, didn't we, Nico, for the first time? Hellbound. Yes, yes. I was a bit freaked out by my voice because I thought, oh, did they use my voice? Or is that just a vocoder or, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of effects in the movie. But then, of course, there, is, there are effects on Doug's voice as well. So, um, no, it was, it was very strange. Um, I, think, I think the most... Um, interesting thing is, is that Doug is the only person who gets to turn into himself, you know, at the end. Uh, I was a bit itchy that I turned into this willowy brunette. <laughs> um, uh, of course, then Nico turns into a little kid, and not surprisingly, um, Simon turns into a, a chubby person, considering he isn't fat at all, but he had to be thin to get into the butterball suit. So, um, um, it was it was interesting seeing it. Um, I, I it, it is part of the movie, so it was. Um, was I peeved? No, no. You know, it's, it's just it, nobody gets to turn into themselves except Doug. Next one for you, Barbie. You were in the music industry for years, touring with Shock, interviewing singers, bands. How much fun was that? Um, well, I'm, I have to say that the 80s was a fantastic decade, and uh, I really enjoyed myself. I got to present TV shows. I was actually presenting a TV show, doing film review at the same time I was filming Hellraiser 2. Um, oh, it was wonderful. I mean, in the early 80s, Shock um, supported bands such as Newman, Depeche Mode, uh, Classics Nouveau, Adam and the Ants, um, and it was it was great. We toured the UK and a little bit of Europe, and we had a residency in New York for a week, um, where we were on stage with people like the Coconuts from Cape Creole and the Coconuts, and we were supposed to do a show with Prince, but our agent brought us back a day early so we could be the entertainment for the Miss Iowa Beauty Contest in Blackpool. And let me tell you, my friends. There's nothing more depressing than trying to entertain beauty contestants who have lost. <laughs> There's all this audience full of beautiful girls who are like, oh. <laughs> but it was, it was great. You know, it was a very, it was an enormous amount of fun. And I have very big, very fond memories of that time. It was um, great. And also when I went into um, TV presenting, uh, I did a show called Hold Tight. And I uh, interviewed people like Cliff Richard, Johnny Lydon, a.k.a. Johnny Rotten, uh, Iggy Pop. Oh, totally wonderful, absolutely professional, adorable people. It was a great privilege to meet them. So it was fun. Um, so a question from Indy Hara. What recent projects have you both been working on and how can people pick them up and support your work? And then there's a couple more questions after this as well. Uh, recent projects. Um, the one that I'm working on at the moment is I'm working on the 
second volume of short stories. Um, I'll be making an announcement as to when that's going to be available in the next two to three weeks. Um, that's called Other People's Darkness. The first volume of short stories, What Monsters Do, uh, that's done well, and I've adapted two of those short stories as plays, which Barbie's going to come and see next weekend, um, okay. which I'm really excited about. Um, that is a very, very interesting experience. Um, writing for the theatre, um, adapting my own work has been very exciting, particularly as I'm working with such a bunch of talented people. Uh, that's part of the London Horror Festival. Um, and that's taking place at the Etc. Theatre in Camden. There are still a few tickets left for those of you in the UK. Um, uh, so there's that. Uh, I've also returned to acting, <laughs> did a day's acting um, for the public slot in ABCs of Death 2. Um, that film should be, I believe, is going to be posted on the website on the 26th of October. It's called M is for Mutation. Um, I've got, if all goes well, I've got five days filming in on two different projects uh, in November. Um, I'm just waiting for one of those projects to be confirmed at the moment. Um, again, they're very exciting, the horror, um, really interesting stuff. Um, I can't say too much about them yet because um, I kind of hush hush until. I'm told I'm not going to really talk about them. But, yeah, I'm really, really excited stuff, basically. What about yourself, Barbie? Right, well, I've um, had a, um, my first novel, and it's called The Venus Complex. <laughs> um, I'm just waiting for the, <laughs> the picture to come up so I can see it. Um, artwork by award-winning artist Danielle Serra, by the way. Um, it's a, basically a, a, a novel that is a diary of a serial killer, and um, I've had some pretty fantastic reviews from Fangoria, Rue Morgue, and uh, Scream Magazine. The, the, one of the, the latest reviews said, this book would make Patrick Bateman blush, which is pretty wonderful, and the editor of Fangoria has called me. And again, this is kind of a, a blush moment because I'm just this little girl from British Columbia, but um, uh, one of the finest purveyors of erotically charged horror around, <laughs> which is kind of um, it's quite wonderful. So, but it is basically exploring the sexual mindscape of the serial killer. It is, it's not for the faint-hearted. I've got a short story coming out in Fangoria's renewed. Um, short story magazine called Gore Zone. It's called Zulu Zombie. And um, I'm not that interested in zombies, but I was given the letter Z for an anthology called The Best Yarn Vocabulum, which is going to be out at the end of the year, published by Western Legends Press, edited by Dean Drinkle. And I thought, oh, what do I do with Z? It was Chinese Z dragons or zombies. So I, I gave it a go and written my first zombie horror story and Fangoria loved it so they're putting it in their magazine and um, we, Nico and I have two, sh um, two a short story each out in an anthology that's available on Amazon all these things are available on Amazon.com all the Amazons um, called The Demological Biblica and my story is called A is for Altdruck and your story is called Z is for this, 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 I can't speak, sorry. <laughs> you, you, can, you can have a look at the contents page on, on Amazon because my, I'm losing the power of speech. Um, it's that early in the morning. I need more coffee. Um, <laughs> Z is for this of, um, this, this, I, this, I, I, I'm sorry. And I also have a, another story coming out in another anthology, um, probably at the end of the year or next year. And it's, an, it's the um, sort of second version of Phobophobia. There was a Phobophobia anthology, and now this is called Phobophobias. And mine was Botophobia. And it's not a fear of bottoms, as it would seem to suggest, but a fear of basements. Um, oh, and the other thing that I'm involved in, which is very important, is the um, uh, I did a shoot for the Women in Horror 
calendar UK 2014. And this is women from all aspects of horror in the UK, in makeup artists, production designers. Um, Emily Booth is in it, and she does horror bits on Horror Channel UK. Um, some wonderful actresses as well. And myself, I'm December, which I think is very apt. And it's a beautiful calendar, but it's not like pinups. It's like people, you know, this one girl makes these exquisite little bugs and she's glued them all over herself. You know, it's, it's, there, it's quite extraordinary art photographs. And, um, that's available. If you go to Facebook, Women in Horror Calendar UK, you can get all the links to where you can pre-order the calendar and it should be out soon. And it's, it's uh, for all the profits go to charity, Rape Crisis and the Sophie Lancaster Foundation. So, I think that's it. Cool. Um, <laughs> the next question is for me, um, and it says, Nicholas, how many stories did you write for the Hellraiser comic series? Um, I have to say, I'm trying to find out the answer to that question on Comic Vine, even as we speak. Um, and uh, it's not that, oh, they've taken, they've taken my comics down. That's fine. That's, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, the I think it's about four or five. It's about four, yes. It's, I think it's five. I can't remember them all uh, off the top of my head. I'm so bad at these things. Um, I know I did four issues of the Nightbreed comic because um, there was a two-parter, and then the last two issues of the Nightbreed comic, which are being reprinted i understand there are 26 issues of the nightbreed comic um and there was an announcement on facebook i think from clive's page that they are being reprinted um but i think hellraiser comics it's four or five um if you find me on t on facebook oh Barbie looks as if she disappeared there for a moment. Um, uh, if you find me on, <laughs> if you find me on Facebook uh, I, and post the question again, I will check. I've got them upstairs, um, and I shall be able to um, uh, answer that question properly and give you all the titles and the issue numbers. But off the top of my head, I can't remember. Um, I, I do have one more little project sure. I'm involved in. Um, Gonna see if this looks any yeah, good. This light. Yeah. Yep. Okay. This is a. Um, it's a it, this is just a prototype of a Pandoric that um, I've been co-designing with someone called Eric Gross for the followers of the Pandorics website. Now, both Nico and I contributed short horror stories to an anthology a few years ago called The Hellbound Hearts. And it was all based on the Hellbound Heart novella mythology that Clive created that started the Hellraiser franchise. And I created a character called Sister Celise. I've done a short story to accompany this Pandoric um, called, uh, well, sort of like the further adventures of Sister Celise. And you can find that on my website. Uh, if you go to barbiewild.com, Barbie like the doll, wild like Oscar, and um, there's the Cil Cilicium Pandoric. And if you scroll down, you'll see a link to my story. It's kind of hidden on my website. So if you want to read uh, sort of a secret short story about a female Cenobite, you can go to my website and, and read it. Yes, and I'm just waiting for Eric um, to put my stuff up. I've also been working on this. I'm just waiting for some designs to come through uh, for my Pandoric as well. Um, uh, I've no idea when those are coming through. <laughs> when, uh, yeah, but he's, he's working on his, his big book at the moment. So he's, he's, he's doing all the big books uh, for the followers of the Pandorics because he did these beautiful um, hand bound books with, you know, lots of designs in and so on, um, which I know Clive is, was very interested in. Um, Nicholas and, oh, sorry, I nearly missed one. Um, how many stories? Uh, this is from the New Old Man Time. Do you think there's a point where horror has crossed the line and become more of just gore effect and not true horror? Yes. Um, 
definitely there are movies out like that. Um, I remember Clive talking about torture porn. Um, and it's just boring, really. Um, it's, you know, there are some very intelligent, gory movies out there. Um, I was watching Reanimator uh, the other day, um, and that is a very gory movie, but it is so intelligent. Um, it's really interesting. It's funny, it's witty, but it also has a lot of heart in it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just don't bother to watch them. Um, if I get very bored with watching scantily clad women being attacked with machetes and so on. Um, I'm just, I find, I get very uncomfortable about that, that thing. You know, that's not about what Clive was talking about when he says, you know, horror is about exploring death and what happens after death and our reaction to death um, and so on. So, yeah, I, I think it does cross the line. And it, when it does cross the line, it's usually just very boring and uninteresting. What do you think, Barbie? Well, I, I, I agree. Um, I've seen some movies recently that I thought were marvelous. I thought, um, although kind of slightly de depressing and yet still extraordinary, I saw American Mary by the Saska Twins. It, what they're doing is wonderful. I saw, I saw Dead Hooker in a trunk as well. And it's sort of, <laughs> it's like snakes on the plane. It, it does what it says on the tin. You know, it's a story about a dead hooker in a trunk, you know. But it's... Um, for that and you know I just I really like what they're doing because they have humor and they are inventive and you know they're the heroines of their stories are all women um, there are a lot of great you know directors who are coming up I have to say from Canada and fem female uh, Yvanka Volkovic is one and um, another one she did a, a lovely short uh, film called The Captured Bird which is just fantastic fantasy um, I, I like suspense and innovation rather than just gore. Um, I, I look back to the films like The Innocents with Deborah mm. Cole, uh, a friend of mine who's, who is a, a writer of, um, she did a review of my, my book for Brutal as Hell. Uh, Annie Riordan said it had, it's the skip, one of the scariest movies she's ever seen, The Innocents. And it's so lovely, black and white English countryside. But actually, whoa, what goes on? Also, The Haunting of Hill House, anything with Vincent Price in it. I mean, I love things like that. I think things more of, of with suspense rather than just crazy with chainsaws. Although there, are, there is a place for crazed psychopaths with chainsaws. I'm not saying there isn't. But um, I recently saw a film that... that was very disturbing called Sinister with Ethan Hawke. Have you seen that? Yeah. I haven't. I remember you talking. I think I don't. Yeah, I, I, but, I might have on DVD to watch, actually. I've got a, a stack it, of about half a dozen. It really DVDs. stays with you because it, it you know, the, the basic premise, which I don't think it's in the opening shot, so it's not a spoiler, is that, you know, this family gets murdered and you find out what happens. But um, I won't say anything about it, but I think when you're rooting for the lead character to get horribly murdered a quarter of the way through, like I was for Ethan Hawke, I had absolutely no sympathy for him. Um, it's like he wasn't following the sensible horror movie rules, which Nico just posted that wonderful short. Oh, no. Sensible horror movie. You know? Yes, sensible um, horror movie. But yeah, go wandering around in your house in the dark with a baseball bat while your family's sleeping, when you think you have a home invader, smart, you know. Um, I just found it kind of irritating, but it was very, but it, it didn't move me in any way. I, I still think about American Mary, and I think, wow, that's an extraordinary film. Um, so it, there are great things being made out there, but I think that it, it would be nice to see a step away from this, but as long as people go and buy tickets to get some people, you know, mm. uh, mushed up in, in disgusting ways, then, you know, th then the people will be making these movies. But I prefer something with a bit more intelligence in it. Um, our next question is from Estereoscopic. Nicholas and Barbie, as artists yourselves, 
do you guys have some favorite visual artist, painter, sculpture, installer? Um, I have to say my favorite artist is, apart from Clive Barker, obviously, uh, is um, John Bolton. Um, I had great delight of getting to know John when I was doing working on the Hellraiser comics. In fact, Barbie and I both modeled for John Bolton for one of the Hellraiser stories. Um, John does these wonderful, wonderful comics um, and just paints these beautiful, beautiful images that are so weird. And he uses lots of different media. Um, and, you know, when he, when he paints a uh, comic page, it is a work of art. He does all the penciling, the inking, the oil painting, if necessary, uh, watercolors. He paints the most beautiful watercolors. Um, so it, it, it's probably John Bolton uh, for me. What about yourself, Barbie? Oh, boy. Um... Sorry, painter, sculptor, installer. Um, I really love the art that Danielle Sarah does, who did my, my um, uh, cover. I, I actually interviewed him for Fangoria. I, I love his stuff so much because it's, it's, it's beautifully executed, but also there's something very um, s sinister about it, sinister and beautiful. Uh, there are so many artists that I love, who, who a lot of them... Um, there's a sculptor whose name I can't remember, who's, who is, his work is quite extraordinary, um, but I can't remember his name at the moment, so I hope I mean, if I had to, to say, you know, a, a great, you, you know, somebody who's like really well known, I like the work of Brock, uh, Impressionist, um, is he Impressionist or Abstract? Cubist, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, this is a question that's taken me a little bit by surprise because I actually can't think of it at the moment. But I would say that Danielle is great. I love Clive's work. Um, but I, I feel really bad because the next time, I will actually post this on my Facebook page because there are some wonderful um, artists um, who, who have done some great Hellraiser stuff, but I can't remember their names at the moment. I will say, oh gosh, it's it's too early in the morning. Um. <laughs> sorry, and I've obviously, sorry, dogs just, I just moved and I've just picked up something. I mean, the other yes, artists. I look very, going through a dark corridor. I, I will say something though. I want to give a plug to a friend of mine who's been an old, old friend of mine. Um, I have a, a friend called Tim Dry who does sort of digital manipulation of photo his own photographs. And his work is quite exceptional. And it's sort of romantic and beautiful and yet dark. And um, he's done some, you know, photographs of Joan Collins, Stephen Burkoff, Mick Jagger. But it's his art, his, his collage is an art that is quite extraordinary. Um, and he also played the monster in Extra which is, for horror fans, very cool. So um, I also like his art very much as well. And of course, I should really show you guys um, the cover of my book. And there's another of my favorite artists is a guy called Carlos Castro, who did the uh, cover to What Monsters Do, because um, you can't really see Sorry, I'll show that slightly further up. Um, check it out. Uh, he does fabulous covers uh, to books. He's a very talented uh, comic artist as well. Um, he did Zombies in London comic book back in the day as well. And he's just recently. That's it. That's a much better picture. Um, so uh, the question from Erises is, out of curiosity, what are the figures behind you, Nicholas? Um, the figures are chatterers. Um, so I won't try and reach you behind me but basically there are two sorts of uh, chatter figures behind me one is the original screaming glow in the dark and then i was trying to remember the maker of the other one which is the animatronic 18 inch animatronic one uh barbie i always find interesting the female perspective related to the psychological aspects of the psychopathic mind 
as a writer and actress, would you like to play a female serial killer? Um, when I was a little girl, I think I, I put this down to too many episodes of The Man from Uncle and the Avengers, and that's the <laughs> Avengers with Patrick McNee and Emma Peel and all that sort of stuff. I wanted to be an international assassin, but only go and kill horrible dictators. And so um, when I first found out about the, um, the, the serial killer, you know, when I first read about the phenomena, I was fascinated. But I've always been fascinated by the criminal mind. When I was a kid, instead of reading little girl stories, I would read Sherlock Holmes stories. And Moriarty fascinated me. I even created this, like, fake backstory for him. So, you know, his wife had died and gone crazy with grief. You know, that's why he became this criminal mastermind. Um, you know, because I wanted to know the why. So I am very fascinated. And that's what my book is about. It's not a whodunit. You know who's done it because it's in diary form. You watch his slow, you know, revolving down into the abyss, if you like, in an entertaining way, I'd like to think. But it's always why, why, why. So could I, would I want to play a female serial killer? Everybody wants to play baddies. Um, I think playing a demon from hell is pretty pretty good, but yeah, sure. But she'd have to be dressed up as a nun or something, because no one suspects people in uniform. Um, you see the uniform, and you don't see the face. So I think that would be the, the great disguise I would use. And you don't ask too many questions. Your questions are very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um... That is the last question that I have in front of me. Um, and yeah, we've been talking for an hour and a half, well, an hour and 20 minutes now. Um, I should really get up and feed the dog. <laughs> He's being very good. Um, but it is time for him to feed, uh, to be fed. Um, cool. Thank you well, very I, much indeed. Lovely to yes, see you again, Barbie. Oh, it's lovely to see you again too, Nick. And I just want to say that both Nick and my books are, again, on Amazon. So if you're interested in horror or serial killers or any of these things that go eek in the night, please check our stuff out on Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, folks. Have a nice night if you're over on the other side of the world or have a good day if you're on our side of the world. Take care. Good night, guys. Night, Robert. Thank you for having us on Indie Horror TV. Yes, and we won't be a stranger yes. to the yes. channel. Thank you, Robert, for having us on. <laughs> it's been great. Thank you. Thank you, Stereoscopic and Swift 55. Absolutely. Everybody who asked us questions, thank you very much indeed. I don't think we're on anymore, Nicole. <laughs>